Good evening. Uh, we are uh, convening once again as the Board of Supervisors today for this item uh, to consider the Fair Housing Ordinance uh, and establish that would establish a source of income protection, increase affordable housing options. I'm um, looking forward to uh, working with all of you and our board this evening on this. Um, it's something that we've been talking about at some length as we've worked through our uh, housing challenges this year as a board. Um, the way I'd like to have the meeting organized will be that um, our staff at our community development agency will begin by presenting a report to us on the ordinance and then individual supervisors can ask questions as it relates to the staff report and then we will take up um, public comment and we'll bring it, bring it back to the board uh, to set direction from where we go from here. So uh, with that, uh, I welcome <coughs> Brian Crawford and the CDA staff, and good evening. Good evening, President Kinsey, members of the board. First of all, I want to thank all of you for adjusting your normal hearing schedule to accommodate an evening meeting, and thank all of those in the audience who are foregoing game one of the World Series. I'm not sure how many Cubs or Indian fans we have in the audience, but nonetheless, very appreciative of all those who have turned out. We have a two-part presentation for you this evening. First of all, Lily Thomas of our housing program staff is going to be providing you with an overview of the proposed ordinance, and then Liz Darby, who, as you know, is the program manager for our fair housing work, is going to make some brief comments on the connection between the proposed ordinance and our fair housing goals. And as you'll hear from this presentation, the proposed ordinance is related to a number of county policies and programs and would also expand upon current state protections for renters based upon their source of income. And we think it, it will do that in a way that also reflects our values as a community-based organization, values that, um, that recognize that we're all equal and that everyone deserves a shot at access to rental housing, including those folks who rely upon alternative sources of incomes, such as Social Security, child support, and third-party subsidy vouchers. And that, of course, is the subject of this ordinance. So with that as an introduction, I will turn it over to Lily Thomas of our staff for the beginning of the staff presentation. Welcome, Lily. Thank you. Good evening, Lily Thomas with the Marine County Community Development Agency, also joined by Debbie LaRue, who's a new planner in our program. Um, I wanted to mention that there's translation services available in the back if anybody needs them. And if there is anybody who's using translation services, we'll need to be aware of that when they're doing public comment because they may, may need some extra time. Okay. Our agenda for tonight is to conduct a first reading and hold a public hearing for the proposed Fair Housing Ordinance to establish source of income protections and increase affordable housing options and to schedule a merit hearing for November 8th at 1.30 in the afternoon. Um, as Brian mentioned, um, this, or this proposed ordinance came out of the workshops, the series of workshops on housing affordability that were held last fall and early this spring with the goal of preventing displacement of existing tenants and preserving um, affordable housing. And the source of income uh, protection was scheduled for phase two, which is October through January. And we're, we're really seeing this as um, the other side and really a partnership with the, pro the Landlord Partnership Program. These um, programs are stronger and reinforce each other. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, as uh, Brian also mentioned, in addition to the series of workshops, um, this program, this proposed ordinance is consistent with a program 2I of our certified housing element, um, increased tenant protections, as well as recommendations that came out of the analysis of impediments to fair housing to look at ways that we can expand housing choice for voucher holders. Um, California state law has a um, source of income protection um, that was passed a number of years ago that prohibits discrimination based on your source of income. So if somebody has a uh, disability or child support as their source of income, a housing provider can't say, no, I only rent to people who have employment as their source of income. 
However, under the, that legislation, um, third-party rental payments are not considered, um, that go directly to a landlord, are not considered a source of income. However, there's a number of California cities that do have this type of ordinance, including Corte Madera, um, East Palo Alto, Santa Monica, and San Francisco, as well as 13 states and 51 local jurisdictions, cities and counties across the state, which protect voucher holders um, from housing discrimination. And some of these ordinances have, have been around for as long as were adopted in the 70s, and some of them are more recent in the past couple of years. Um, the ordinance that we have in front of us today, um, first of all, it applies to the unincorporated part of the county only. Um, sometimes there's confusion that it applies across the cities and towns, and again, it's just in the unincorporated portion of the county. And under this uh, proposed ordinance, a landlord would no longer be able to advertise no Section 8. And if somebody was applying for housing, whether they had a HOFWA voucher for people who have AIDS or a Section 8 voucher or a VASH voucher for our veterans, they would need to be evaluated um, on neutral criteria and not just denied housing based on the fact that they have that type of voucher. So they would be um, evaluated and for that housing just on, as any other um, tenant would be. Um, in addition, um, this proposed ordinance would require that a landlord consider third-party rent payments when evaluating an applicant. Um, and this could, would cover both vouchers and payments made by local organizations like Adopt-A-Family who pay um, a, family, a portion of a family's rent. Um, it also protects uh, unmarried partners and roommates to ensure that their incomes are calculated in the same way as married couples when evaluating their rental application. Um, some of the exceptions um, where this ordinance would not apply are for units um, that are sh shared living arrangements where the property owner lives in a unit and either shares um, a kitchen or bathroom or if there's um, less than three units in that structure. Um, and the recommendation of the three units or less is tied to, it, it tracks um, some exemptions that are in the uh, Federal Fair Housing Act of 1968. Um, and again, the, the proposed, you know, we're in a, a very tight rental market right now. It's difficult for everybody, for, you know, many people are struggling with finding rental housing, but our voucher holders have a, an additional barrier because there's a certain number, there's a significant number of units that they just do not have access to because the, from the start they're advertised saying they don't accept Section 8. And so the intent is not to require that somebody accepts Section 8, but that they evaluate a Section 8 tenant or a VASH voucher holder um, using the same neutral criteria that they would evaluate another rental applicant. So um, a housing provider could continue to screen applicants using criteria such as a credit score, rental history, or references. And a, a recent study found that ordinances such as this um, result in a 12% increase in housing availability for voucher holders. And it might not seem a lot like a lot, but when we have as low a vacancy rate as we have in this county and such a limited amount of housing, that could make a significant impact. Uh, um, next, I'd like to talk about kind of the the Landlord Partnership Program, which was another um, incentive that came out of the series of workshops that you held, looking at ways that we can incent landlords to rent to Section 8 and other low-income tenants. Um, and this program was designed in collaboration with um, local community landlords, really, and it was tailor-made to address their concerns about accepting landlord or accepting Section 8 vouchers, so that we could increase the number of landlords who are participating in that program. 
there was a contract for $400,000 that was approved by your board in July of this year to provide um, incentives such as vacancy um, protection or vacancy um, coverage, um, security deposits, and damages to, again, address the concerns that people had with se accepting Section 8 um, vouchers. There was a kickoff event that was held in October, where uh, October 5th, where there was over 60 housing providers in attendance. It was a great success. Um, they have a 24-hour um, landlord hotline that's available. So if somebody has a concern on the weekend or after hours, there's somebody there to address that um, and answer uh, any questions that they may have. And so far, seven landlords have been assisted financially through the program, and 16 new landlords have already signed up out of their goal of 25 before the end of the year. And finally, I wanted to um, use some, you know, mention again the importance of this program. And ra rather than just using data and kind of best um, practices that other jurisdictions have have done, I thought it would be useful to hear from this um, single mother who advertised on Craigslist saying that she's a single mom with full-time employment and her nine-year-old daughter and I have a Section 8 voucher. We need a home of our own. Section 8 pays 70% of our rental fee. I have cash for deposit. A two-bedroom, preferably with washer-dryer hookups and a small yard. I have excellent references and a good car. My daughter has never had a room of her own. Please, if you have or know of a rental, email me and I will respond. Thank you for reading our ad. So next, I'd like to invite Liz Darby up, um, and she's going to talk about how this ordinance aligns with the fair housing and equity work that she does. Thanks, Lily. Good evening, supervisors. Um, as all of you know, the analysis of impediments to fair housing choice was approved by the Board of Supervisors in 2011. It identified 29 specific recommendations to address barriers for fair housing choice here in Marin. Expanding the source of income protection to include Section 8 vouchers will address several of these recommendations. Under the Landlord Partnership Program, we can expand the Section 8 program. We can make the program more visible and comprehensive. We can partner, encourage, and support more landlords to participate in the program. And working with the Marin Housing Authority, we have an opportunity to not only educate landlords about the program, but we can also educate tenants and applicants on their responsibilities as renters. Oops, sorry. On a broader level, income, no matter the source, is about equity, primarily because income determines where you live, and where you live matters. In 2010 to 2014, here in Marin, 250% of the federal poverty level was $59,000 for a family of four and about $39,000 for a family of two. An estimated 70,700 individuals in Marin County were below the, uh, the federal poverty level. That was about 28% of the population. Where you live also determines where your children go to school. And we know that low income levels are associated with poor health, more stress, and lower self-confidence. In 2012, 85% of white three and four-year-old children in Marin attended preschool, compared to 35% of Latinos aged three and four years of age. Where you live also affects the quality of the air you breathe and the likelihood of having open lands and parks nearby. Between 2010 and 2012, Life expectancy for residents in Marin City was on average 73 years. In Ross, it was 88. And 51% of Marin Latinos and 72% of African American seventh graders in Marin do not meet the healthy fitness zone standards compared to 44% of the white. Where you live determines the availability of healthy foods. Households with limited resources to buy enough food often purchase cheap, energy-dense foods with low nutritional value. And food insecurity 
has been linked with poor health outcomes. Where you live determines your access to good jobs and transportation. Unemployment is associated with higher rates of self-reported poor health, long-term illness, higher incidence of risky healthy behaviors, including alcoholism and smoking. Where you live affects your mental health. Residents with lower incomes have greater exposure to trauma and mental illness. 40% of African Americans in 7th, 9th, and 11th grade here in Marin County reported feeling so sad or so hopeless almost every day for two weeks or more that they stopped doing some usual activities. That is 12% higher than the rate for the entire state of California. Where you live also affects the probability of becoming homeless. The average life expectancy for individuals experiencing homelessness is 25 years less than those in stable housing. Where you live matters, and your income and the source of that income directly affects where you live. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. Um, that concludes our presentation. We're happy to answer any questions you have. Okay, thank you. Before we go to the public comment, I would ask if any supervisors have questions they would like to pose to the staff or at this time. At this time. Okay, uh, Supervisor Arnold. <coughs> um, I know that we have heard about the Santa Monica ordinance and I'm wondering, have we modeled our ordinance after that? No, our ordinance was modeled after East Palo Alto's, which has been in effect longer, and um, that's, the, that's the ordinance that we modeled it after. Thank you. Well, as a follow-up to that, since she asked that question, just you mentioned that Corte Madera has um, this uh, element in their ordinances as well. Is there similarity between East Palo Alto and Corte Madera? Corte Madera doesn't have as extensive as East Palo Alto. Corte Madera only protects you if you are a voucher holder who is living in an apartment and your name comes up on the list and you, your landlord who you're already living there needs to accept your Section 8 voucher. So it doesn't protect somebody who isn't living, seeking. you know, who's seeking housing. They may be living in an overcrowded situation or whatever or is looking for housing. Thank Palo Alto does. Okay. East Palo Alto does, as does this proposed ordinance. Very good. Okay. If there are no other questions, then uh, we'll open it up for folks in the public that would like to speak. We'll have three-minute limits on um, your speaking, and uh, appreciate respect for all people in the room. Good evening, Supervisors. I'm Kerry Pearson, and I, I read all of the materials available online about this initiative, and I get it. So it appears to me that, in effect, we're creating another protected group, which I'm fully in support of. But as I, I focused on the remedies. And, from, and, and first of all, the study based on this 12% number increase is in Chicago. I'm not sure it's a relevant comparison. Um, and in terms of remedy, it said two to $400 fine. And, was, and, I, and I'm just saying that the number of people that this is going to impact is little to begin with. Having listened to the Housing Authority meetings, it seems that rent, it, it prices out beyond Section 8 to, uh, uh, to a great extent. But for those people that it is impactful for, no part of the remedy showed the person getting a residence. At the end of the day, this for, fine, maybe a misdemeanor on the record, does not accomplish getting that person, that voucher holder, the residence. It's just like with all the other fair housing laws. Unless residents in the, in the apartment, house, whatever it happens to be, is the end result, what we end up is with, with training and, and all these various uh, mechanisms which don't change the number. So I would... Uh, I like the idea, but unless the resolution, unless at the end of the day that Section 8 voucher holder ends up with a residence, and, and the, uh, the fine I think is meaningless. So, thank you. 
Hi, um, my name is Wendy Botwin and I live in Fairfax. Um, I know that when I first moved to California and lived in Alameda County in Oakland that it was completely impossible to even get on a waiting list for Section 8 or any affordable housing. Um, and I know that it's also hard here in Marin County. Um, and so to even get on the list in the first place is almost impossible. And once you're on the list, you wait for years, many years. Um, so if someone's lucky enough to finally get a voucher, which isn't so easy to get, and then can't find anywhere to live and then loses that voucher, it, it makes no sense. <laughs> and that voucher actually guarantees that a landlord is going to get their rent that they're asking for. I don't see the point in discriminating against people who have a very clear source of income once they have a housing voucher um, and can obviously pay the rent with it. And there's so many other you know, ways that, that a landlord would be protected under the system when it's not so easy to get and keep that voucher in the first place. So to go to finally get a voucher and then go looking for a place to live, which is as you know, as we all know, is quite impossible these days. But um, to be turned away having a voucher and then ending up losing it because you can't find anywhere to live just ends up creating a homelessness problem that's even bigger than we already have now. Thanks. Thank you. Hi, my name is Stephen Nessel. I'm from Marinwood. And um, I'm here uh, in defense of economics and common sense. Now, I know this is a difficult time for renters, um, but I ask you to just consider some basic economic laws that affect all of us, sure as gravity affects all of us. Um, people tend to operate, uh, both renters and landlords, in their own interest. Oh, and by the way, I do want to preface this. I am not a landlord. I own my house. but. I don't own rental property. Um, anyhow, uh, everyone w operates in their own interest. And if pe landlords are saying no Section 8, it's not that they don't want to take your money or take the, the guaranteed government check. It's just that they feel that uh, their economic options are better with uh, someone with different sources of income. This ordinance that you're about to look at is only a penalty. It doesn't create more housing. And that's what you need to be focused on. Um, there are some positive developments, uh, the landlord protections, as well as the second units. Um, and I do think the proper way to, to incentivize this is through the landlord protections and also uh, incentivize people to build second units. This is a tough time, and I, I, I feel for everybody in this room who's having a, time, a tough time finding a place in this environment. But I don't think putting out uh, punishments for landlords is going to put, get more properties on the market. In fact, I think just the opposite. I think uh, the risk for landlords will go up, and they will actually demand a risk premium for the properties to price uh, Section 8 uh, tenants out of their the market. Um, this is, like I said, this is economics. This is not um, social policy. Thank you. Hi, my name is Lisa Baldwin. And um, I, I would like to reiterate some of what she said. It's just real important when you're out there and you are trying to find a place and it gets tough and it's even tougher when you lose a place because I have and I'm trying to get my voucher back. I'm disabled and I just see so many people out there that need help, elderly people, disabled people. I, I just see this as being a good thing because it would help us find more places. I know even when looking on Craigslist, when you're trying to find a place, there's definitely no Section 8 on a lot of the listings. So I would just really encourage you guys to consider this this ordinance because it I think it would help greatly in making it less hom homeless people out there and helping us people who are trying to find an apartment find a place to actually live and put a roof over our heads. So I just wanted to 
tell my story and let you guys know. Thank Appreciate you. you being here. Uh, Raleigh Cats Marine Association of Public Employees, as you know, we have long advocated multiple measures to try to do things to make housing more available to people in this county. Uh, we see this proposed ordinance as one of those things that you can do in a very positive way. I have to tell you I'm a tad bit confused. I've been here for another uh, um, other meetings when we've talked about building more housing, more affordable housing, dense housing, and we've heard all kinds of opposition to that. Um, I've then read in the newspaper that rather than building more housing, just make more Section 8 vouchers available. And now we're trying to make more Section 8 vouchers really mean something, and apparently that causes a problem. Also, with all due respect, people don't always act uh, rationally when it comes to economic decisions. If they did, we would have never had Jim Crow. Good evening. Bob Pandoli speaking for the Marine Environmental Housing Collaborative. Uh, MEC would like to urge you to adopt the Fair Housing Ordinance. This ordinance is vitally necessary to widen the available housing stock, to assure Section 8 vouchers and the money they represent stay in the county, um, and to prevent direct housing discrimination as well as the disparate impacts. The housing crisis is shared by all Marine municipalities. <coughs> the cities and towns should follow your good example and adopt um, uh, similar uh, fair housing ordinances to protect source of income. Your housing element documents the urgent need for affordable housing in all Marin jurisdictions. Countywide, there are over 27,000 households, <coughs> lower income households, that are paying more than 30% of their income for housing. Section 8, ha the Section 8 program ex expands affordable housing opportunities, but too many of these opportunities are being lost. As your staff report points out, in a 20 month period that ended in August, um, over a thousand households holding vouchers couldn't find a place um, where they could use them. And in fact, almost 250 of those families took, that, took their voucher vouchers out of county. Um, survey by the Community Development Agency and Legal Aid show that some of this is due to um, refusal by some landlords to accept Section 8. The staff report reminds us that the 2010 analysis of impediments um, identified substantial um, impediments to ethnic minorities, families with children, people with disabilities, and other members of protected classes. Section 8 is a potential remedy, but its effectiveness just isn't available if property owners can refuse to accept the vouchers. Um, thank you for adopting the Landlord Partnership Program. We think this is an excellent initiative that will offer incentive, incentives for <coughs> Section 8 for landlords to accept um, Section 8 vouchers as a as a viable option. Um, and finally, the housing crisis is shared by the cities and towns as well as the unincorporated county communities. The 1,063 families that weren't able to find housing um, between January 2014 and last August um, surely didn't restrict their search to the unincorporated areas. We strongly urge that your board encourage the cities and towns to follow your good example by adopting source of income protection ordinances. In closing, we strongly urge that you adopt the Fair Housing Ordinance. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Carolyn Peavy with Fair Housing of Marin, and uh, Supervisor Kinsey and board members, I thank you for this opportunity. <coughs> this ordinance has been in the offing since last year, and to date, out of the housing, elements, uh, pr housing element program, considering all the possible tenant protections and affordable housing options, uh, for, the, for development or preservation, we've yet to see any tenant protections implemented. I think it's time. As you know, I'm always looking at these things, um, at these issues through a fair housing lens. And I believe that this ordinance uh, is a crucial step to preserving affordable housing and for the most vulnerable um, in our county. Low-income people are comprised of a disproportionate number of African Americans, Latinos, families with children, and people with disabilities who are all protected classes under federal and state fair housing law. Section 8 voucher holders fall into one or more of these protected classes, so such an ordinance would address the disparate impact that the lack of affordable housing um, has on these groups. I've talked several times about the tenants we see who are in danger of losing their vouchers or must port out uh, because they can't find a landlord who accepts Section 8. Currently, landlords in Marin County uh, can decide whether or not they want to accept Section 8, as you know. The great thing about this ordinance is that it doesn't require landlords to rent, <coughs> excuse me, 
to Housing Choice vouchers only to consider their applications. All rental applicants, including Section 8 voucher holders, only are, are, are going to be held to the same standards and the same screening process. Earlier, we've heard um, about the tonight about the um, landlord, um, the landlord program, the landlord incentive program, and it's an incentive program for landlords um, to try Section 8, which I think is great. Um, and it was a perfect opportunity for Marin Housing Authority to garner input from leaders um, among landlords and, and management companies to learn how best to improve the Section 8 program and make it as effective as possible for participating landlords. Now we have that input, and this ordinance is the next logical step. Both the county and Marin Housing Authority have obligations under federal law to affirmatively further fair housing. What steps will the county take to preserve and create affordable housing and promote integration throughout the county? Adopting this fair housing ordinance is an important step toward making housing more affordable in Marin County for the extremely low income and positively impact the elderly, people of color, families with children, and people with disabilities. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here. Good evening and thank you. With me tonight is Pastor Tom Gable, Betty uh, Cray from the United Methodist Church, Kathy Dunas from St. Vincent de Paul, and Deacon Bernie O'Halloran from my church, St. Anselm's. We're all members of the Marin Organizing Committee, and we represent thousands uh, of uh, constituents in all five districts. And we strongly support the proposed Fair Housing Ordinance. <coughs> Marin has precious few homes for seniors, disabled, and individuals of family and families of low income. We cannot afford to lose more of this housing, and we certainly cannot afford to mark hundreds, if not thousands, of units off limits to those who desperately need it. If you are concerned about homelessness, as are we, we think this ordinance will increase the number of housing <coughs> opportunities for people in precarious housing situations. It will offer relief to many who spend months searching for reasonable rents. This ordinance is fair to renters and to landlords. Nothing in this ordinance prohibits landlords from verifying the rental history and references of every applicant. It will make it easier to find quality tenants by increasing the pool of eligible applicants for each unit. The next week, we start the ninth season of rest. We need to do more than provide companionship, dinners, and a church floor for six months of the year on our, at rotating locations. This ordinance will provide additional opportunities for our rest guests to move beyond homelessness and into housing. We encourage you to vote for the Fair Housing Ordinance. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to get to speak tonight. Uh, my name is Herbert Taylor, and I live in San Rafael, and I'd just like to share my story with you. Uh, my partner and I moved here five years ago this week. We purchased a house in San Rafael and looked forward to our new life in the Bay Area away from the Texas heat and Texas intolerance. After feeling settled, we planned on moving my mom here. She is a funny, fiery British woman who is elderly and disabled. Since her Section 8 housing voucher transferred, we started the process of trying to find her a place to live. Using the voucher in Texas was never an issue. Not once did I encounter a problem finding her housing. Not the case in Marin management companies told me Section 8 holders were undesirables and wouldn't accept voucher holders. Here is some of the misinformation I heard from management companies. Section 8 tenants lower property values. Untrue. 
Section 8 people are subsidized by the government, and the government is going to stop paying. Untrue. And my personal favorite, Section 8 tenants ruin the property and make horrible neighbors. My mom's story debunks this myth. After almost losing my mom's voucher, I finally found a property manager who said that the management company didn't like Section 8, but the tenants on his property that had a voucher were the best of tenants. They kept their places clean. They had a great sense of community with all of the other tenants. This was evident after we moved my mom into her new home. The Guatemalan family next door that had a Section 8 voucher went to the store for my mom and even rescued her after she had a dangerous fall. There might have been a barrier of language, but definitely not of the heart. There is a lot of work to be done here in Marin. It's going to take some strong will to better our community for all of us. I asked the Board of Supervisors to take a stand against the irrational fear, thinly veiled prejudice, and misinformation spewed by blogs, next door, and certain neighborhood groups. I ask you to be a voice for all of our neighbors, not just the privileged. I ask you to encourage diversity, equity, and fairness. I ask you, the Board of Supervisors, to vote in favor of the source of income protection. I ask this as a homeowner, I ask this as a voter, and I ask this as the Board President of Fair Housing of Marin. Thank you. Good evening, my name is um, Adriana Ames, and some of you know me as the Education Director of Fair Housing and Marine, but today I'm representing the Latino Council of Marine uh, and the Board President of the Latino Council of Marine, and I urge you to approve this ordinance on behalf of the Latino community who face great challenges in finding housing. Uh, we believe this ordinance we greatly benefit um, our families and individuals. Thank you so much. Thank you. <coughs> Good evening, Louis Jordan, Executive Director of Marin Housing Authority. I, uh, I stand in full support of the ordinance. I think during these times, it's, it's almost unconscionable to believe that an individual can put in writing a, um, a source of discrimination that is obviously um, in writing when you read no section eight. At the same time, I, I encourage, and the Housing Authority will be an active uh, part of an education process, helping our landlords understand what this ordinance says and what it does not say. Uh, there's been a number of uh, references to the uh, landlord outreach program that we're currently in the midst of and, and I'll say that through that process we've we've confirmed landlords that we have in the program that they're in a good program but more importantly we've we've encouraged and solicited new landlords mm -hmm. and a lot of that occurs through an education process through a listening process and through an understanding process so again we support this ordinance but we also would like to be a part of conversation because there is a, a population of landlords out there that are very concerned about what this is saying. I know it's not saying that, but there needs to be an opportunity to better educate that, part, that population who indeed is a part of our partnership. Thank you. Thank you. M Mr. Uh, Jordan, if I might uh, take the chair's prerogative, just relative to a single question. Um, the history of the Marin Housing Authority with um, these homing assistance uh, program, HAP program vouchers, payments. Um, ha have we ever terminated payments uh, with landlords when we're in contract with them? Um, yes. In the, in the midst of a contract? We, we have. And, and normally, when and if that happens, it's because the landlord isn't holding up to his or her responsibility in providing safe, sanitary, and affordable housing. Um, if I'm understanding your question, Mr. Chairman, we've never reneged on a payment. We've never not been able, as a matter of fact, when you look at HUD's perspective on the HAP payment, the absolute last thing we can do is not follow through on that agreement, meaning that if we ran out of money, we would halt putting new people in the program 
but under no circumstances at all are we a ever able to not pay that landlord. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good evening, uh, Supervisors. Uh, my name is David Levin. I'm the Managing Attorney at uh, Legal Aid of Marin, and I'd like to thank you and the planning staff for putting this proposal together because we regularly see people who've lost their vouchers or face the loss of housing at, at Legal Aid, and, and we do our best to try to help them on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, but in my caseload right now, I have uh, at least three clients who lost their vouchers after waiting on the list for years, and even, you know, the Housing Authority has been accommodating and granting multiple extensions, but you've seen the figures that show the, the difficulties and the barriers and, and just the evidence that we see at Legal Aid, it seems to fall uh, most harshly on, on the disabled. And, and those are the clients we see not only trying to lease up after they've finally gotten a voucher, but also we have clients who have been in place. I have a client right now who was renting in a place for over 10 years when the landlord said they just decided to stop participating in the Section 8 program, really had no other reason. And we were able to work that out on, in that case and help that client. But we, when we see uh, these ads on Craigslist, it's, it's really troubling. Uh, also, the planning staff pointed out that uh, Oregon, the state of Oregon, passed this law over two years ago, and it's working just fine there, many other jurisdictions. At Legal Aid, we recognize the two main parts of the barrier for uh, Section 8 participants. It's, it's the HUD rent levels, because we're working to keep those up with the reality in Marin, and HUD actually this year did make a big bump. But the other barrier is, is this discrimination and, and the uh, lack of fair access. We're just talking about access here to housing. And when we see the blanket denial on, on Craigslist of no Section 8 without individual consideration of our clients, that reflects poorly on Marin County. And this ordinance that will protect the access to housing for really our most vulnerable residents, that will reflect well on Marin County. So we thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ora Hathaway, Marin resident, <clears throat> and also for a while I was on the resident advisory board and I do fully support this uh, new fair housing ordinance um, to protect the source of income um, for Section 8 tenants. And I do know that uh, Marin Housing Authority is committed to um, taking care of any rent increases that may happen even though we have no, t uh, we have no cap on it, uh, on, on, on what they can increase and that they have frozen vouchers um, to take care of that increase. And so I fully support this. I, I need to look at the actual content of it to make some more specific comments, but I thank you for your efforts in this. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Good evening. My name is Rachel Guinness. I'm the executive director of Lilypad Homes. And um, Lilypad, uh, we, we very much uh, support this ordinance. Um, I, um, given the presentation, I understand that this does not necessarily apply to the work that we're doing, creating ADUs and junior units in the community but we are actively out there um, and very proudly promoting the program, working with the Marine Housing Authority. And I can tell you, I just met with a homeowner today. Um, they are looking at the, uh, at the um, landlord partnership program to create a junior unit in their house. And they were very open to the idea of um, going through the program and therefore housing somebody Section 8 because their, their own daughter is a Section 8 holder. And her story was very touching where she could not find she looked at very, uh, n a number of opportunities to have housing where she would have been able to have her dog and had roommates and they wouldn't accept her voucher. And she therefore ended up living in an apartment alone without a dog because that was the one place it would get accepted and it was such a sad story. Anyway, so they're giddy happy to um, work with the program and I just hope that somehow in all this we can uh, um, create an educational um, opportunity to like relanguage the Section 8 program. I mean, I really think of the work that the Marine <coughs> Housing Authority is doing and the, the county as um, it's just a magnificent program, uh, the way that they're truly offering fair market values. Um, everybody should give this program a look. Um, I can only equate the assistance that they are giving to the, uh, the housing concierge <laughs> service. Um, I just, I'm thrilled to be working with them and I really think that this is an opportunity for landlords um, and homeowners alike. And uh, thank you so much for considering. Well, good evening, my name is Dave Corey. I'm a landlord. 
I find myself in agreement with almost everybody who's spoken, even Stephen Nestle, who, Nestle, who called for more units of affordable housing and pointed out that economics is like gravity. And it very much is because it affects people very differently. And what we're dealing with here is a good example of equity where we provide a baseline of acceptance and lack of discrimination for access to housing. This is a good step and I look forward to greater steps ahead. I would ask you to consider one important plank and I was just lucky to follow Ms. Guinness because it leaves out those units that are rented by a homeowner when they live there. I th it, especially given the supervisor's decision to pivot to Marin-sized solutions, I don't think any single unit should be exempt from fair housing or accessibility regulations. So I would ask that not only do you, that you use this as a springboard to other jurisdictions, but that you apply it to every rental unit in Marin. Good luck. Thank you. Aren't these 530 meetings amazing? Please have more of them. Good evening, Good evening, Supervisors. <clears throat> I'm Stephen Bingham of San Rafael, and Faye Hens of Corte Madera is joining me up here at the podium. And we won't talk long, but just to support everything that everyone has said in favor of this ordinance, including the last words of the gentleman, I think that at least should be thought of as phase two. I also want to draw your attention. I'm not representing CLAM, the Community Land Trust Association of West Marin, but I was made aware of a letter that they sent to you in support of this ordinance as well. Um, my final comment would be, since no one else said it, ideally there should be some kind of reporting mechanism built into this because it's all too easy for a landlord who finally can't put these words in an ad <laughs> to simply know that somebody's source of income is what it is and determine they're not going to accept them as a tenant anyway. And I hope that isn't the case, but I'm wondering if there's not some way to track uh, how people are refused and have a complaint process in pl place for tenants so that if they feel that they're being discriminated against, even if they're not in the grotesque sort of Jim Crow redlining way that they are now, that they might have some place to go to complain about it. But on general, you're really to be commended. The staff, this should have happened 30 years ago, it didn't, <laughs> but it's wonderful work you're doing around the affordable housing issue, and keep it up. Thank yeah, you. I agree. <laughs> I have a story to tell. Do I have a minute? You do. Um, my husband and I uh, watched the uh, Mer uh, Corte Madera um, uh, Marin Garden, or, you know, in Corte Madera near the town center. We watched it being built, and it was $17,000 in 1952. We bought our house in 1975 on Seminole Avenue, Corte Madera, for $45,000. And uh, now my house is going for 1350000 I get letters every day from people who want to buy my house. Unbelievable. Are you still married? <laughs> <laughs> Hello, my name is Angelo Duvos. <clears throat> I'm a retired teacher. I want to thank the board for the good work that's been done to prepare this uh, ordinance. I want to speak from the perspective of uh, us uh, older folks. I'm a senior, and I recently, just a year ago, bought a home in Los Robles Mobile Home Park in Novato, not far from Hamilton. I was really happy to be able to stay in Marin, and I'm a halfway owner. I own my house, but I don't own my property. 
I pay rent for that. Now, I think it's uh, a really, really simple thing for the board to continue to do the right thing and to vote yes on this proposal in comparison to all the problems we have as a nation and as a community in terms of housing. This is a no-brainer. It just really is. And I know that the board will do the right thing and support folks who have the Section 8 voucher. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is, sorry, I'm not used uh, good evening, my name is Leah Simon Weisberg and I am the legal director of Tenants Together. We are um, interveners to the litigation in Santa Monica and wanted to take the opportunity to um, answer questions if there is about any of the, the litigation, but also just to say how important um, this step is. I have been spending the last year in different cities um, trying to address the housing crisis that we have. And in many jurisdictions, um, it has revolved around looking for rent control and, and just cause as those solutions. While I still believe that that is um, part of uh, the solution in terms of addressing um, the need for affordable housing, this is also an important point. And I think that one of the things that's always been very concerning is as I go to these other cities and, and am advocating for rent control and just cause, folks who don't, want us to have rent control and just cause, we'll talk about how they don't want to be subsidizing um, others. And here is the subsidy program that um, prevents landlords from having to do that when you don't have rent control and don't have just cause, and yet people can't use it. And if we look at also the homelessness problem, um, here we have a solution and we're not able to use it. So it is really such an important step and really um, thank you for, for doing it and hope that it, it passes and we can um, start addressing that, that component. Um, I have been in several depositions where um, landlords were very specific that when they were purchasing, um, they specifically would ask whether there were Section 8 um, vouchers there because they wanted to establish um, what the race of the population was in the building. <coughs> and I think that by saying you are no longer lawfully allowed to list that on your advertisement, on the one hand, changes that it's not acceptable anymore, but it also changes the value of that program. I think that when landlords are looking at other advertisements and they're trying to say, how do I promote my um, property, and they see that people are putting, saying that, um, then that it has become part of the fabric of how we talk about um, the people in our community, which is very problematic. So the, your leadership on this um, really goes beyond just people will have the opportunity, but it's really gonna be changing um, you know, how we're gonna be able to use this program all over the state, so thank you. Thank you, if I might, I would allow Supervisor Sears to ask you a question since you offered the, your availability relative to the Santa Monica situation. Sure, yeah, thank you for being here and thank you for doing that. Is the Santa Monica ordinance the same or similar to this proposed ordinance? It is somewhat different. I think that what is um, important on all of these is that the purpose is about affordable housing, and so that allows communities to I'm not interested in this. the purpose. I'm interested in what the litigation is about. So is there something different in that ordinance that is the target of the litigation that's not part of this proposed ordinance? The, the target of the litigation is they're saying that it is preempted and that because at the state level you're not allowed to do it, that somehow everyone else isn't allowed to do it. And it is our position, and frankly, I think everybody who does this work um, position, that, um, that the, it is the purpose that is the difference. And when you're talking about preemption, so if you say that the only reason you're doing this is only for fair housing, and you got into issues of that, then it would be similar. I mean, that's why I'm, I'm not trying to not answer the question. Okay. But the, the thing that... The I, uh, you know, I used to be a lawyer, so I didn't, I wanted you to focus on what the lawsuit is about. And it yeah, it's about, about preemption. Purpose, then. It's about it, preemption. It's about preemption, yeah. and we don't yeah. believe that it's preempted because the purpose... Right. Yeah. That part I get. Okay, yeah. thank you. So, but it's, it's not yeah. a complicated... I mean, I don't know if you've read the the pleadings, but it's not. I haven't, that's why I wanted it's to not, ask you a question. It, I think that it's important that just, well, and I think for those who are attorneys in the room, know that just because people file a lawsuit does not necessarily mean that there is a lot there, and I think that there's not a, I mean, I think it's important to note that it's not the California Apartment Association who has filed the lawsuit, it is just the local um, one, and that we've had ordinances in other cities where no one has, has sued, and I think that that should be Take okay. note of that detail. Yeah. Thank you very much. Like East Palo. Alto. <clears throat> Thank you. 
Good evening. My name is Roland Lee. I'm a property owner in Marin County. Um, I came with no prepared speech, but I'll just go over some things that I came across is that there's no such thing as reasonable rent in Marin County. It doesn't exist. I'm a property owner. We have a dilemma. We have X amount of people wanting to live here. You want affordable housing. There's no such thing as affordable housing in the Bay Area because it's the most expensive place in the United States. How, do you, how in the world can you expect to have cheap rent in the most expensive place in the country? You have a dilemma. The federal government does not want to build any more housing projects. I am a product of a housing project. My f I grew up in a housing project in San Francisco, Hunters Point. My father was an immigrant. My mother was first born here. My father worked two jobs. He worked in the morning and he got home at 12 because he worked a second job at Bethlehem Steel. He was a welder. Okay, so there's no such thing as a, you know, reasonable housing here. The government does not want to build any more housing projects. They've, if you've noticed, they've ta taken most of the housing projects down in San Francisco. They were problems. They're problematic. When you give away, when you have rent, rent control and you have subsidized housing, you have a tenant in your building forever. They're not going to leave. Why would you leave if you're only paying $200? I own a building. I do have Section 8 people. I've been in the landlord business for 41 years. I work there every day. I'm not somebody that just talks about it. I, I, do the, I, do the, I do the walk. When you're cleaning somebody's toilet, tearing out, I, you know, I remodeled this building I, apartment by apartment. There's 10 units. I went through every one of them one by one. It's a lot of work. I did it with my own hands. Okay, what happens is I've had Section 8, and to tell you the truth, I oppose the ordinance change of must accept Section 8 housing vouchers. That's ramming somebody, something down someone's throat. That's, that's, that's not right. You're just going to be upset about it. Okay, I've, I've rented Section 8 people. I have Section 8 people now. I have two, two out of the ten right now. I had three. The one person, they, I, what, what I definitely want to take, uh, talk about is uh, my bad experiences with them. Because I get, they get subsidized housing, the government, which you both, both you and I, pay through through our taxes, that's how, that's how they get subsidized. I would like to have free housing too, but I don't do that, I worked. Okay, I would like to take, uh, I would not take them again because my personal experience is that they do not take care of the property and they tear it up. The properties, when you build an apartment, or fix it, re re renovate an apartment, there's a 27 and a half year depreciation schedule. If you put $10,000 in a new kitchen and you depreciate over 27 and a half years, you get very little back. That kitchen and bathroom does not last 27 and a half years. You're lucky to get 15 years out of it. So that's wrong. Thank you for your comments. Okay. Uh, we, your time is up, sir. Okay, I had a lot more to say. Thank you. Thank you that's for being asking. here. I'm Don Magdans. I uh, live in San Rafael. I um, own one property, uh, four units, that has a uh, adopt a family. Uh, in one unit, and I have um, a duplex that I live upstairs, and I have a Section 8 tenant downstairs. Um, I'm retired, which is uh, uh, typical of a lot of our, peop uh, our, our people who uh, depend on the rental income for their pension, uh, and I think that should be uh, taken into consideration. Um, Marin Housing Authority had a lunch for the uh, Landlord Partnership Program. Uh, I was really shocked. I walked in the room and there were a lot of people in there. Uh, they had done an outstanding job of getting uh, uh, well attended. Uh, the people at my table were very receptive. Uh, they need more touches to get them signed up. Uh, uh, I'm on Damon's housing committee. Um, I do speak for myself. I'm not speaking for the committee. We did have a meeting on um, Friday the 21st, a couple of days ago. Um, and. Um, uh, four landlords attended that meeting, um, and all of us, including me, had uh, objections or questions concerning this ordinance. One of them is um, uh, that Section 8 does require you to sign a government contract. It is a not a negotiable contract. It is put out by the government. Um, I'm sure we're going to have some pushback on that one from, from some landlords. 
Um, the intent um, is to get no discrimination from people who have different sources of income. However, as, as Lewis uh, kind of um, implied as well, it, it really doesn't say that very effectively in the, in the agreement, so when, or the contra, uh, ordinance rather. So when you're a landlord and you start reading this ordinance, it can be misconstrued. And I think it would take, be nice to take some time to make sure that that's not the case. Um, also, we got the ordinance draft on Thursday the 20th. We had our meeting on the 21st. Today's five days later. Uh, we really haven't had a chance to vet this thing out. And of course, based on some of the things you said about uh, the lawsuits that are coming there, we should make darn sure that this is uh, not uh, subject to those kinds of things. Um, I also mentioned that um, uh, there's some exclusions in this. And I think that as far as you know, two and three unit buildings, and that doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense if you have multiple, if you're living with those with somebody. Um, this, co this ordinance, I I'd like to see MHA have some time to try to make this landlord partnership work, work, uh, program work. And I suggest that we uh, uh, wait on this ordinance, put some more time into the, to the wording of what it says, and survey the rental listings for Section 8 people and uh, determine uh, you know, the people that are, are saying no to Section 8 and, and see if we can, we can uh, make some progress uh, by talking to these people rather than putting in this ordinance. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, supervisors. My name is Mallory Spilker. I'm the Vice President of Public Affairs for the California Apartment Association, the North Coast Division, or CAA as I'll refer to us. CAA represents over 125 housing providers and over 5,600 units in Marin County. CAA and our members do not support any form of discrimination. We are committed to ensuring our local housing providers do not engage in illegal or unethical activities which violate the Fair Housing Act. We frequently host local fair housing events and also have on-demand 24-7 fair housing we webinars available for our membership. As it stands, we cannot support the proposed source of income ordinance due to the fact that a similar ordinance is being challenged legally at the local level. It was mentioned today, that's the Santa Monica ordinance, and I believe you have my letter highlighting why that is. We want to wait for a court ruling on this issue before addressing these types of ordinances and recommend that the county do the same. CAA is committed to encouraging members to accept Section 8 vouchers, and we plan to continue to par partner with local housing authorities to find ways to streamline the Section 8 process, enhance the payment standard, and make the program more attractive to rental owners. Our focus has been and will continue, continue to be collaboration with both the county and the housing authority staff. Um, we want to promote the new Landlords Partnership Program and the Section 8 program. At its successful launch three weeks ago on October 5th, the new Landlord Partnership Program recruited numerous new landlords, as you saw in your PowerPoints, um, to participate in the Section 8 program. And we received from my rental housing provider community a very positive response. We are headed in the right direction. We wish to maintain this swift forward momentum and continue to partner with the county and Marin Housing Authority to garner increased support from local housing providers for both the Section 8 program and the Landlord Partnership Program. Thank you. Hello. My name is Lucille Bailey, and I live in Terra Linda for about six years. A couple of years ago, some investors bought the property and now they're evicting me, and I have until one more month to move out, and I can't find anybody to take my voucher. So I've given legal aid lawyer David Levin two pages, back to back, four pages of places I've gone to, and I've looked at, no one wants the voucher, and no one's moving. I did find one place that would take my voucher, but they don't have anything right now, and we gave it to the lawyer and asked him for an extension, and they said no. They want me to move. So I'm being evicted, and I'm pretty desperate because they said the sheriff's going to come and lock me out of my apartment, and I'm 80 years old, and I have no place else to go, and I was going to ask my supervisor, Mr. Donnelly, if it's possible for him to talk to their lawyer and ask him to let me stay in this apartment until the apartment I found that has 324 apartments with 30 vouchers has an opening for me because I'm the first one on the list. 
and they said, no, I can't have it. So I came here because I'm desperate to try to get some help because I don't want to be locked out of my apartment. I have no place to go. And Thank I can't you. find anybody to take my voucher. And I've lived there for six years. And that landlord that said, we ruined the property, we never, I never ruined anybody's property. I've lived there six years, I pay my rent on time. And uh, he's wrong about that. The only reason I'm in this is because when my husband left, me with two kids and no child support, that's how I got, and I worked in Marin County, I never made enough money to pay the rent that they charge here. And I'd appreciate if anybody in this room could let me move into a place temporarily because I'm signed up at a, le at a senior apartment in Terra Linda, Maria Fritas, but I have another year and a half to go, the man told me when I called, before I can move in there. But I need a place to go now before I'm locked out of my apartment. Thank you okay, for sharing. I appreciate your story, any help your from concerns. somebody. You bet. Okay. All right. Um, I believe that completes uh, the public comment, and uh, I will close the public uh, hearing. We'll bring it back. Uh, it, does the staff have any specific things you would like to add before we bring it back to the board, based on the presentations of the individuals who spoke? I, I did want to mention that the, uh, although there's been um, significant public testimony tonight, that the merit hearing is scheduled for November 8th. So there's two weeks away. So there, if you know, if there's additional comments or there's landlord groups who would like to meet with us, um, we're available to do that. Um, in addition, we're working on some frequently asked question materials that will be circulating out to people to hopefully clarify um, exactly what the ordinance does and what it doesn't do. Okay. Are, are Lily, could, you, items could you maybe uh, address the, uh, the specific issue on the units represented by homeowners, that aspect of the ordinance? The exemption C1. The exemption. Yeah, yeah, yeah so unit the exemption um, currently exempts if a landlord lives in the unit and shares a bathroom or a kitchen, or if they live in the unit and there's less than three other units on the property or on in the structure. It so it just says, or the structure contains fewer. It does that fewer. if the landlord has to live there. Yes, and it's, it's an fewer and. than three. right. Yes, I misread it. Thank you. So, um, can you tell me why why you put why that's in there? Um, that language comes from the federal, the 1968 Federal Fair Housing Act. There was, uh, there, there was a three-unit exemption, and so that was why we used that. Would there um, be any, any problem with taking it out? Uh, n I don't think so. I don't okay. think so. And if we took it out, could we still do the first reading and have the merit hearing on the 8th? No. That, that would there potentially be a preemption well, issue, Davis? Right. Well, I don't. Um, <coughs> we haven't researched that issue. The okay. preemption issue that uh, oh. was talked about earlier was just the issue about whether the fact that since under FEHA, the Fair Employment and Housing Act in right. California didn't define this as a source of income, whether that preempts us doing it oh. under our police I power, see. which is gotcha. a different issue, which I agree with the uh, prior speaker is. It, it probably you. doesn't have merit, but it's just a trial court action. Anyway. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I, I'm going to invite uh, Supervisor Arnold and then other uh, supervisors that wish to speak at this time. Well, first of all, I just want to thank everyone for coming tonight and for hearing your comments. Um, I think we should have all of our meetings at 5.30 if they nice people like you come. <laughs> 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 um, we spend a lot of time talking about the importance of pr preserving affordable housing in Marin. And the need for affordable housing in Marin, our commitment to promoting fair housing in Marin, and our desire to end discrimination. These goals have been discussed in great length by our board over the past several years, as Marin has been under increased scrutiny by HUD and our, for our fair housing practices. HUD requires local governments to go beyond addressing illegal discrimination and to take local action to chart, to change past hat patterns of inequality 
and to promote inclusion and diversity. As we all know, Marin has a high concentration of low-income residents and minorities located in just two neighborhoods, the Canal and Marin City, and Southern Nevada is fastly growing to be the third. One of the ways we can help address this continuing trend is to alleviate some of the barriers that fair housing voucher holders face when they're looking to find housing in Marin. This ordinance provides us such an opportunity. I have listened and heard the concerns raised by the landlord community. I think it's important to remember this ordinance does not require landlords to rent to Section 8 voucher holders. It requires landlords to consider their applications. Landlords can still screen their applicants as they would any other applicant and if appropriate, deny them accordingly. I think the fact that we have recently kicked off the Landlord Partnership Program thanks to our colleague Supervisor Conley and the Marin Housing Authority. This is a benefit to landlords, not a hindrance, this ordinance. I'm encouraged by the participation of the landlord community and it's important that we continue to work together and communicate about the challenges that you face so we can continue to address them. As a county supervisor and a Marin County housing director, I'm committed to continuing those conversations and making changes to address the concerns. We have an opportunity tonight to stand up for what is right and fair in unincorporated Marin. We have an opportunity to take a meaningful step towards the goals we continually pronounce. And at the appropriate time, I would like to make a motion for the first reading. Thank you. Supervisor Rice. Uh, thank you staff for your work on this and, uh, and uh, everyone who came today uh, to speak and who's been following this issue, this more broader, this broader issue around our efforts here at the county to, um, to try to meet our community housing needs and we have a range of co community housing needs that are not being met. And this, I see this actually, um, this, this one step as one of many in a sort of multi-prong effort to preserve what existing affordable housing is out there, to add to our uh, stock of affordable housing and to expand, and this was a really important piece that this to, um, of our effort to expand the um, program base for the, uh, of housing and, ha and uh, opportunities out there for folks who have, whether it's a Section 8 voucher or a VASH voucher or a HOPA vouchers, um, we are having to do a lot of different things. Um, no one step is going to be a panacea towards meeting our community housing needs, but I think this is an important one, both symbolically and practically, uh, towards making sure that doors are open for anyone to apply for a unit that's placed on the market. So um, I would be happy to second the motion and look forward to November 8th. And um, thank also Lewis for your work at the Housing Authority and Supervisor Connolly for your work on all this. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Supervisor Sears. So I too want to thank everyone who is here tonight. We had some just wonderfully articulate speakers, um, very moving, and, and thank you. And particularly for those of you who shared your individual stories about your experiences, that's very very moving and very meaningful. So, you know, I think it's it's apparent that there is some degree of misperception uh, out in the community about uh, this ordinance and uh, the fear that there it requires the acceptance of such con Section 8 vouchers. I think, as others have said, it's very important that we have time to sh to spread education and really help people understand what this ordinance is about and also what the Landlord Partnership Program is about. And Lily, I think you did a good job of explaining how supportive that program is and how it's intended to address some of the concerns that we've heard about this particular ordinance. And I think you know, people need to, to be able to learn more about that program and about this ordinance. Um, you know, I think we all can agree that it's simply not appropriate to advertise no Section 8 housing. And, I, and shame on us 
that there is more tolerance for Section 8 housing in Texas than in Marin County. This may change my entire perception of the state of Texas, and I didn't <laughs> expect that to happen. Um, and I don't like it. <laughs> so, That's true. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no. No, that that was quite a that was quite a story, and uh, I didn't think it was acceptable before Texas came up, but now I'm really concerned about it. But I do think that this ordinance, I would support the ordinance applying to all units. I think if we feel strongly about not discriminating and not sending a, nex a negative me uh, message that no Section 8 housing uh, cannot be the way that one approaches advertising and renting units, then that's that should apply to everybody. There's no exceptions for how you treat other people. Um, Liz Darby, I want to give you a shout out. I think you're, what you presented on the importance of where you live uh, really says it all. And uh, these are just very important issues and values for all of us. Where you live matters. And I think we want to make sure that there is at least fair consideration for everyone uh, in all parts of our county. And so I appreciate all the work that's been done by various folks who've been thanked and hope that we will move forward and hope that we will move forward with the education campaign because I think it's crucial that we address the misperceptions and the fears and uh, make clear to people that there are benefits both from the partnership program and from treating everyone fairly. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Connick. Thank you, and a, and a big ditto of thanks to both staff for the hard work and the community for coming out on a Tuesday night, and for those who submitted written comments uh, to us as well, very thoughtful. Um, as been noted, I think you know we can say, um, certainly for me, I'm very pleased at the progress we've made overall on the menu of options we set out through our four housing um, hearings late last year and early this year with, with the community's help. Um, that list of phase priorities I think is proving very productive and, and fruitful. Um, we've made some meaningful progress to date, most notably the Landlord Partnership Program. I have not been shy about touting that program, so thank you again uh, tonight for that. Um, we had a successful rollout of that on October 5th. Um, no fewer than 90 uh, attendees, uh, which was huge. The energy around it since has been uh, great uh, from the landlord community. Uh, so again, much appreciated. Just to quickly put this ordinance in context, um, I've often referred to um, how the conversation around housing has changed in Marin in recent years. That means we pivoted from getting bogged down on a debate about large scale or high density development and instead, instead recognize that we won't be able to simply develop our way out of our housing crisis locally. So our goals are to preserve affordable housing opportunities and prevent displacement through strategies that are based on community support. One of those strategies is the Housing Choice Voucher Program, otherwise known as Section 8, and other similar type uh, voucher programs. It really is a way to meet our goal of preserving and increasing affordable housing opportunities within our existing housing stock. And I see this ordinance specifically as a logical extension of the Landlord Partnership Program where we are seeking to break through perceptions about what that program actually is. And we see it as um, a way, a program that can benefit both landlords and tenants alike. I don't see this ordinance uh, before us as representing a mandate forcing landlords into participation in Section 8. We cannot emphasize that enough. Instead, it's narrowly tailored as an anti-discrimination measure. So what do I mean by that? The opposite of discrimination is the application of neutral, non-arbitrary criteria in decision making. And in the event that a Section 8 applicant is qualified based on neutral criteria, credit score, 
references and the like. Their voucher should not be an impediment to them being considered for rental housing. In many cases, uh, those holding vouchers are people who experience barriers and impediments to finding housing. And this is one way of removing uh, a barrier to that. No one is saying that this is the end all and be all solution, but this is a piece of the framework. So I want to also state my support for the proposal at issue here. I would second a motion if it's forthcoming on expanding the uh, ordinance to include other types of housing. Okay. If, Thank if that's forthcoming. Yeah. And final point, um, we certainly want to preserve our solid working relationships with all the stakeholders, tenants as well as landlords, as we continue to work through our menu of housing and initiatives. Thank you. Um, I too want to thank everyone who's participated this evening across the board regardless of the perspective that you brought into the room and uh, appreciate the genuinely civil way in which we've discussed this. Uh, it is a great reflection of the interest that I think we have as a shared community in um, allowing opportunities for everyone to eliminate discrimination. Um, more recently in our country we've come to realize that many of the ways we've organized our governments have been structurally biased against certain classes. Um, we're going to hear more and more about that as uh, different communities come to terms with structural bias or structural racism. Um, this is a great example of something that we can address tonight, uh, get started on, um, that is consistent with that uh, realization that we need to set our ordinances, the playing field for all to have equal opportunities um, and that um, historically we haven't hit that target and so I think working together we can. I particularly want to call out and thank the representatives from the Property Management Association for working closely with us on the housing incentives, uh, on the landlord incentive program and uh, to work together to make sure uh, with our local managers that we're communicating accurately with folks to reduce their unfounded anxieties and to take their uh, sound suggestions as we go forward. Um, I think that um, all of us know that Marin County and the Bay Area and in fact most urbanized areas in our country are suffering from housing crises. Um, but certainly if we speak to our own situation, if we can increase the pool of opportunities by 10 to 12 percent, that's a significant uh, effort on our part and we want to move forward with that. For me personally, I would encourage our board not to amend tonight, but to ask for a first reading. And then when we have the merit hearing, we could give direction to the staff to um, begin to prepare for an amendment to this that could include um, those uh, property owners who have more than uh, units. I think there's some discussion to have about exactly what we want to do with that, but I don't think it's a discussion to postpone this. Um, now we do have a motion, a second, and a, a willingness for another second. So I just want to confirm with our clerk that we do have a motion in front of us for a first reading. Um, thank you. Um, with that then, um, I'm going to ask uh, for the vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? So uh, we have unanimously approved the first reading with the expectation that we'll have the merit hearing and take final action perhaps on the 8th of November. The clerk. Ordinance of the Marin County Board of Supervisors amending Title V of the Marin County Municipal Co Code to prohibit discrimination based on a person's income. Very good. And with that, uh, our meeting.